So this is week four of our Jesus series. Um, we really just prayed at the beginning of the year, what do we want to walk through this year and what better to walk through the life of Jesus? Um, anytime we get to sing about Jesus, talk about Jesus, it's going to be a good day. It's a good thing. The topic's always awesome when we're talking about Jesus. So um, we covered a couple big things. We're, we're really kind of walking chronologically through the book of John. So if you missed any of those, we do have a YouTube channel and Spotify and iTunes and whatever you need. Um, you can go back and listen to the talks. Uh, but one of the big themes that John talks about from the very beginning is he, he establishes that Jesus is God, that he's not just a good guy, he's not just a prophet, he's not just a teacher, he's actually God in the flesh. This is a big theological truth that we have to wrap our brains around because we've got to know who we're following and we've got to know that the scriptures are true. Jesus said he was God, the disciples said he was God, and the, the witnesses that wrote about him said he was God, and, and at the end of the day, that's a faith moment. The scripture says the moment we believe that Jesus is God, the moment that we believe that he lived and that he died and that he actually rose from the dead, defeating sin and death, the scriptures say that we'll be saved. And we're going to talk more about that, but that's a, a huge preface that we can't just skip over. We've got to understand that Jesus is God. And then we looked at in week two, why did Jesus come? And we talked about how Jesus came so that we can become the children of God. That there's this identity that God wants to give us. That apart from God, apart from Jesus, we're trapped and we're enslaved to sin. And the Bible says that we're actually children of wrath. Until we call upon the name of Jesus. And so what he came to do was this adoption process to say, no, through faith in me, through proclamation of my name and following me, I want to adopt you and I want you to become a child of God. And then we, we talked about in, in week three, uh, what, what does it mean to, to follow him? What does it look like to come and see that he's good? What does it mean to, to leave everything that you have and come experience what it is? And we talked about how all the disciples, when they met Jesus for the first time, the very first thing they started to do was they went to those closest to them. They went to their brothers and their sisters and their kids and their families and their friends and their neighborhood. And they're like, man, I have found God in the flesh, the Messiah, the Christ, the one that we from old have been looking for. He's here. Come and see. And so we really just talked about faith. What does it mean to really trust, to like Peter, drop your net, drop your business, drop your job, and just go see what Jesus is doing? And he did. And the moment he was convinced that he was truly God, the moment that he was convinced that he could be a child of God, he boldly proclaimed the, the mission. And that's what our job as Christians are to do, is to boldly proclaim that we've met Jesus, that we know God, that we can be children of God, and that through this message called the gospel, the good news of Jesus, his life, his death, his resurrection, that people can be saved, people can be free from bondage, people can be free from their sin. And so today, um, it's going to be a little bit different. Um, I've got actually a pretty long clip that I want to show you here in just a minute. But in John chapter 3, there's this really cool conversation that Jesus has with a man named Nicodemus. So Nicodemus was a Pharisee. Corey was talking about some of them earlier. Pharisees were the religious leaders of the, the, the day when, when Jesus was here. These were the Jewish authorities. These were the guys that ran the temple. You had the priests and the fair. They, there was all these different sects of, of actual like worship in the temple, and the Pharisees were very powerful. They were the ones that actually were pursuing Jesus because he, they, they were mad because of the claims that he was saying. They eventually end up killing him for being a heretic because they thought they were protecting the doctrine of the church. They thought they were protecting and they thought this man was claiming to be all these things uh, and they didn't believe in it. But the crazy part was Nicodemus, although he was a Pharisee, he was actually witnessing and hearing all these miracles that Jesus was doing. He was actually seeing Jesus uh, cast demons out of people and seeing demon-possessed people become healed and whole and normal. He literally saw paralyzed men get up off of their mat, had never walked before, and because Jesus said, take up your mat and walk, he saw it. And so even in his wisdom as a scholar, as a, as a Pharisee, he was like, man, there is something going on here and I need to check it out. I need to find out who this Jesus really is because the things that he's doing, I've never seen anyone do before. And he, a matter of fact, the things that I see Jesus doing, I haven't even been able to do before. This is the mindset of Nicodemus. 
And so in John 3, what I want to do, and the reason I want to show you this, and y'all heard me talk about an app called The Chosen uh, at the beginning of this series. So if you haven't downloaded that yet, man, I'm telling you, uh, just erase everything you're watching on Netflix right now. Download The Chosen app. You can live stream it from your phone. You can literally throw it up on your TV. Uh, there's eight, se- there's eight um, episodes already for season one, and it's literally walking through the life of Jesus. It's the largest funded, peer-funded um, film or whatever you want to call it that they've ever made. Um, it's amazing. Like, I was sick with the flu and in bed for two days. I binge-watched these in, like, a day. It was awesome. But, like, they're quality. They're really, really good. So I'll give you a little taste of it here in just a second. But what I love about the series is not just the content. Obviously, it's about the life of Jesus, so it's amazing. But I love that it really brings you into the culture and the context. Like, you get to see the streets that he walked in. You get to see the people that he actually talked to. And, and, and it's just, you see the emotion and, like, the humanity of who Jesus was. Like, he actually has a sense of humor. Uh, he actually, uh, you see him playing with little kids, and you see him interacting and making jokes and, and messing with his mom and, you know, stuff like that. Like, it just, sometimes when we read the scripture, I feel like we just feel like we're reading, like, this cold, like, holy, liturgical thing. And, like, but he's a real guy. These are real people. These are real-life human beings that are struggling through life just like me and you. And so what I want to do is like 90% of what you're going to see in like this, I think it's nine or 10 minutes, so bear with me. It's a long clip. I normally wouldn't do this. But everything in this we're going to read in the scriptures, but I want you to see it. I want you to feel it first, and then I want to walk through a couple things. So if you guys would go ahead and play this. Welcome, Nicodemus. Don't be alarmed. He's waiting for you. I asked the owner of this house for more lanterns, but he said they would draw attention. Yes, I imagine they would. The human eye is drawn to light. We can't help it, it just happens. There are many things we are drawn to without our thinking or our ability to explain why. Thank you for agreeing to meet. Thank you for trying to help Mary when you did no help. You were meant to be there. Me? So I could fail miserably at an exorcism in the Red Quarter? (laughs) If you had not been there that day, would you be on this roof tonight? I don't know where to start. I have so many questions. Shall we sit first? Oh, yes. Of course. Eastern slums. Hmm. Many wandering preachers have succeeded in gathering crowds with their rhetoric and fiery tone. I've heard a few of them over the years myself. So you know the type. Mm -hmm. But I have never heard anyone tell a paralytic to get up and walk, much less it actually happened. So what is your conclusion? I believe... You are not acting alone. No one can do these signs you do without having God in him. Only someone who has come from God. And how is that belief going over in the synagogue? (laughs) (laughs) Which is why we are here at this hour. What else? What have you come here to show us? A kingdom. That is what our rulers are worried about. No, not that kind. Then what? A sort of kingdom that a person cannot see unless he is born again. Born again? Yes. 
You mean like a new creature? A conversion from Gentile to Jewish? No, no, that's not what I'm talking about. Then what is born again? I hope you don't mean return to the womb, because that would be a problem for me. My mother, may she rest in peace, is dead. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. That part of you, that, is what must be reborn to new life. How can these things be? Ah, a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Huh? I'm trying, Rabbi. I know. I know. Do you hear this? What? Listen. What do you hear? The wind. How do you know it's the wind? Because I can feel it. I hear its sound. Do you know where it comes from? No. Do you know where it's going? No. That's what it is to be born again of the Spirit. The Spirit may work in a way that is a mystery to you. And while you cannot see the Spirit, you can recognize his effect. Mind is consumed with thoughts of what a stir these words would cause among the teachers of the law. Yes, and I do not expect otherwise. I speak of what I know and have seen, and it has not been received by the religious leaders. It is hard to receive. So if I have told you of earthly things, and you do not believe, how can I tell you heavenly things? I believe your words. I just fear you may not have a chance to speak many more of them before you are silenced. I have come to do more than speak words, Nicodemus. More miracles? Yes. But even more than that. Do you remember when the children of Israel complained against God and against Moses in the wilderness of Paran? Yes. They wanted to return to Egypt and they cursed the manna that God sent them. And then? They were bitten by serpents. And they were dying. But? But God made a way for them to be healed. Moses lifted the bronze serpent in the desert, and people only needed to look at it. So will the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Our people are not dying from snake bites. They're dying from taxation and oppression. I'm sorry to disappoint you. But I did not come to deliver the people from Rome. Then from what? From sin. From spiritual death. God loves the world in this way. That he gave his only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So this has nothing to do with Rome. It's all about... Sin. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, Nicodemus. He sent him to save it through him. It's as simple as Moses' serpent on the pole. Whoever believes in him will not be condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Have you ever heard anything like this before? Shh. When I met Lilith, Mary, that day, I told my wife and my students I said she was beyond human aid. Only God could have healed her. And then I saw her healed. And here you are. The healer. I my whole life. I have wondered if I would see this day. Follow me, and you'll see more. Follow you? Join me and my students. 
In two days' time, we leave Capernaum. Come see the kingdom I am bringing into this world. But I... I, I can't. You have a position in the Sanhedrin. You have family. You are getting advanced in years. <laughs> I understand. But the invitation is still open. The invitation to what exactly? <laughs> to lead a nomadic life, to... to give up who I am. It's true. There is a lot you would give up. But what you would gain is far greater and more lasting. Is this another one of your born-again mysteries? Maybe. I know mysteries aren't easy for a scholar. Think about it. Hmm? Take your time. On the morning of the fifth day, we leave and we'll meet by the well in the southern quarter. I am standing on holy ground. <laughs> holy roof, anyway. I do hope you come with us, Nicodemus. Is the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. binge watch that tonight, I promise you. John 3, 1 through 15, if you have your Bibles, let's, uh, let's jump into the scripture. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher from God, for no one can do the signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I have said you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know And we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. And so what I want to extract um, out of these first truly, truly statements that Jesus said, he first said, truly, truly, unless you are born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. And then Nicodemus says, how can I be born again? And then he says, unless you're born of spirit and of water, 
you will not enter into the kingdom. And there's a real profound thing that we need to grab. You see, Jesus was speaking wisdom that Nicodemus had never heard before. Jesus was talking about the things that you try to internalize in your intellect and in your knowledge and your understanding of the scriptures because Nicodemus would have known the Bible more than any of us. Nicodemus would have known Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, like almost by heart. He would have known these things and studied these words, and he would have known the prophets of old and all of the uh, prophecies that were saying that a man was going to come and be the Messiah, be the Christ. And so it's almost crazy to watch and to see and to think about these things of like, man, how did they miss it? How did they miss it if they were so knowledgeable with the scriptures? How did they miss when he was there, when he would sit down and have conversations like that? How would they miss that he's the Messiah? And I think their intellect was so literal with things like they would miss things right in front of him. Notice he went straight to like, please tell me you're not saying I need to go back into my mom's womb because rest in peace, she's dead. That's going to be a problem for me. But the reality was Jesus was simply saying, no, this isn't a physical thing. He says, if those things that are born of the flesh is flesh, but those things born of the spirit is spirit. So the very first point that I want to make this morning is that spiritually dead people don't see the kingdom of God. Spiritually dead people don't see the kingdom of God. And we need to understand this. We need to understand that what the Bible is bringing, what like our response to the gospel is, is it's a spiritual reality. And see, just like Nicodemus, this was really hard for us sometimes because spirit realm stuff is weird. When we talk about heaven and angels and seraphim and visions and miracles and all these things, like our head knowledge really wrestles with these things. And so when we say follow Jesus, or if we say give your life to Christ, or if we say be a born-again believer in Jesus, all of those things, we really wrestle with this. But you see, faith in Jesus actually ignites true life. When we call upon the name of Jesus, when we hear the good news, when we decide whether you're 7, whether you're 13, whether you're 25 or 55 or 75 on your deathbed potentially, those who call upon the name of Jesus, it says, your spiritual deadness comes to life. That literally God redeems you, saves you, cleanses you from all righteousness, takes his spirit and literally breathes it into you. So that spiritual side of us, see, we, we think physical. We think the physical realm. What can I taste? What can I smell? What can I touch? What, what do I know? It's why a lot of us who are super educated, we really struggle with this. This is why there's this like rivalry between science and faith. When in reality, all of the things of science, all of the brilliance of knowledge point to a creator. They all point to this amazing design that like it's impossible that all of the things that we know and taste and touch and can see that they just appeared. Like you you would never look at a beautiful piece of art or a beautiful piece of literature and just say, it just so happened to show up. Like no, when you read a good book, you say, no, somebody wrote this. Somebody with a brilliant mind created that song or created that symphony. You don't just put instruments in a room together and then all of a sudden, you know, the symphony sounds come out. No, there's, there's an architect, there's a, a musician, there's gifts and skills, and all of these things were created by somebody, but we think in the physical realm. So you might not physically see God, but I love what he said about the wind. Like, do, do you know where the wind comes from? I mean, science says, you know, whatever, but we don't see it, but you feel it and you see the trees and the leaves moving. And Jesus said the spiritual side is like that. Like you may not physically see the kingdom of God, the spirit, but you might feel him. You might see the effects of him. You might understand that like, wow, my my thoughts are different than they used to be. While the deep desires of my heart have started to kind of shift and change and transform, so like something's happening to me. 
I remember when I was a seven-year-old kid and I heard the gospel for the first time, my heart was beating so bad in my chest, I didn't know what to do. Like it was literally like something physically was happening to me and I didn't know what it was, but I was so drawn to the message. And I believe with all of my heart that is the spirit that is churning and moving. I didn't see it. I didn't know where it was coming from, but I could feel the presence of God. And that's what the spirit is. That's what the kingdom of God is. But there's this intellect barrier that we have because it's not always logical. I'm a logical person. I'm a skeptic by nature. I want to know how things work and move. And it's honestly why I'm so drawn to the scripture because I want to know the purpose of my life. I want to know why every one of us wake up every morning and, and, and live life. I want to know what this is all about. So to me, logically, where I've landed in life through study and research and doubt and fear and all of those emotions, I believe the word of God is true. I believe Jesus is real. I believe he actually came. I think logically you can't deny that he was a man. You can't deny the claims that he made, the historical accounts of his life, his death, his resurrection. But we can't make this a physical, logical thing. Jesus said, unless you're born again, unless you're born of the Spirit, then you're not going to see the things that, that we see. And then I love that he closes with that, that, and he's talked more about it in this scene than he did even in the scripture, but there's an Old Testament reference. And he, I love that he's talking to Nicodemus. He says, do you remember that scene when the snakes came and the serpents, there was this moment of judgment and the nation of Israel was being bitten and they were dying. God told Moses to grab this golden staff and, and make this metal thing. It's actually the, if you've ever seen the symbol for medicine, it's that staff with the snake that's wrapped around it that almost looks like a pagan worship thing. That's actually a Bible story. That's the moment where God said, I want you to take this staff and I want you to make it this certain way and then I want you to lift it up in front of the people and everyone who look upon it will be healed. And Jesus says faith is just that simple. The son of man is gonna be lifted up and he's talking about the cross that all who look to me will be saved. You will be healed. All you have to do is look to Jesus and he looks at Nicodemus and he says, I know this is hard for a scholar. I know mystery is really hard for a scholar. And let's be honest, we're pretty educated people. Like Google it, <laughs> right? YouTube it. You can do anything. We have endless knowledge, endless access, endless proofs to the things of God, but we get so trapped in our heads sometimes. When Jesus said it's just as simple as looking up to me. I was actually wrestling with this before I came up here and, and God kind of put something on my heart that I want to do in this moment that might actually feel a little weird. But this first half of, of my talk before I get into the John 3, 16, which so many of us could probably quote, and then John 3, 17, I really believe in the very beginning of this, I, I want to I take a moment and I, I want to pray. I want to spend some time in my message right now and I want to pray. And I want to ask God to move because the reality is some of you, you have a knowledge of God. You have a head knowledge of Jesus. You have a head knowledge maybe of, of the Bible and some stories and some concepts. But I really believe with all of my heart that the Holy Spirit needs to do some work in this room. The Holy Spirit needs to, to, to breathe life into us because it has to move from here to here. This 13 inches of space is like life and death, eternal realities. That it has to move from a knowledge to a transforming spiritual birth. And so what I want to pray for us right now and just in this moment, um, if you would actually bow your heads, close your eyes with me for a second. I'm not done preaching. We're going to get back to this in a second. God, I feel your presence. Like the wind blows, we don't know where it is, where it's coming from. But God, we feel the effects. God, we see it. And Father, I want to take a moment. Holy Spirit, I want to invite you to invade this room right now. 
I want you to invade our minds. I want you to invade our hearts. And I want us to do real business with you for just a minute. Father, I ask and I pray that if there's even one single person in this room that is limited to just a head knowledge of you, that has never truly been born of the Spirit, God, I pray for salvation today. If you're in the room and you are hearing maybe even this news for the first time, if you watched that movie or if you've heard the gospel, I want you to know that God wants to save you. Jesus said, I came to save you. I came, I lived, I died in your place, I paid the debt for your sin, I fixed the slavery and death issue, and I rose from the dead. Romans 8 says, if we will call upon the name of Jesus, if we will believe in our heart that Jesus rose from the dead, that he will save us. So in this moment, before we even move on in this service, if you have never given your life to Jesus, I I pray right now that you would, in your own words, in your own mind, say something like this in your head. Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I believe. I believe that you came. I believe that you're God. I believe that you died for my sins on the cross, and I believe that you rose from the dead, defeating sin and death. I call upon the name of Jesus for salvation. I beg and I ask God for you to forgive me, cleanse me, give life to my spirit because it's dead. Breathe life into me that I would be spiritually alive. I want to follow you. I believe and I trust in you. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. The reason I felt led to do that is because I really believe that the next section of what I want to cover in John 3, 16 through 21, is actually speaking to believers. It's speaking to those who may be right here in this room just called upon the name of Jesus. If your heart's beaten, you might have just got saved. But ask for the Spirit to continue to move because what I'm going to talk about here in a second, this is hard for us and there's a lot of work to do. But there's a lot of things that that we're going to talk about every week in this church that's impossible for us to do if we're not truly born again believers filled with the power of the Holy Spirit to actually go out and do this. So if in this moment or if at any point in our services, if you decided to follow Jesus, please use that card and say, today, check the box, I decided to follow Jesus. We'd love to pray with you. We would love to walk through what it looks like. We'd love to help you take next steps. We want to disciple you on what it means to follow him, what it means to teach others the truth about what it means to be a Christian. So if you need help, if you know nothing about faith, man, please check the box, follow Jesus, and we want to teach you. But I want to continue now in John 3 because this is hopefully speaking to spirit-filled, born-again believers of God. Jesus said this, In John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come into the light lest his works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes into the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. Most of you know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have eternal life or everlasting life. But it's really John 3.17 that I really want to hang out with for a minute because Jesus said, 
I didn't come into this world to condemn the world. I came into this world that the world might be saved through me. You guys know the WWJD? What would Jesus do? I'm going to make some new t-shirts that says, what wouldn't Jesus do? Because in this moment, he said something that he didn't come to do. And what he said I didn't come to do was condemn the world. I didn't come to judge the sinner. I didn't come to beat people over the head with a scripture. I didn't come to find people that are wrestling with drugs, wrestling with sexual identity, wrestling with things that this world has darkly and deeply wounded. I didn't come to find that person who has been sexually abused and now is very sexually active to condemn them to hell. I didn't come to say you're a bad person, you need to you know, clean yourself up or you should follow all these rules so that maybe I would accept you and be pleased with you. What Jesus said was I came not to condemn the world but to save it. I came to live. I came to put to death the temptation that the devil brought me in the wilderness. I came to defeat sin and death. I took the blows. I took the thorns. I took the whip. I took the cross for you. So that when I died in your place, because the penalty for your sin is death and wrath, Because you were a children of wrath, I came to make you my child and adopt you by living, dying, and raising from the dead. Jesus said, that's why I came. Not to condemn the sinner, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. He said, the light of the world has come. But he says, and what I I think about, and I love this light analogy, it's like all through scripture. You see, darkness does not seek after light. It never does. So if our thoughts are, hey, let's come and let's worship and let's preach God's word and let's talk about the gospel and darkness is just gonna like flood to the light. It doesn't work that way. The light comes to the darkness. The light takes the truth. It takes the life. It takes the spirit, the kingdom of God and it literally takes it out. And it pursues darkness. But if you pursue darkness, which again is sin, if we're to go pursue sin, are we going to go condemn people? Are we going to go judge people? Are we going to go talk about how good we are and the things we did and the mission trip we went on and the things we did with our money and the things that we do for our quiet time and the things that church does and the songs that we sing? Or are we just going to go love people right where they are? Are we going to go meet them right where they are in the depth of the darkness and the filth? The Pharisees would see Jesus hanging out with prostitutes, tax collectors, thieves, and robbers, and they'd be like, what's he doing with them? And what did Jesus say? He said, I didn't come for the righteous. I didn't come for the religious. I came for the sick. I came for the broken. The sick don't need what you have. What the sick need is life. They need healing. And so for us, I think this is a real wrestle in our culture because let's be honest, this requires humility. I've done this. I've condemned the world. I've said what's right, what's wrong, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. And yeah, there's a place for being honest with people because Jesus very, very often would say, repent from your sin. But it was never judgment. It was never condemnation. It was never this tactic of shame and fear and guilt and all this oppression. It was, no, I'm going to meet you right where you are. I'm going to come to the dark place and I'm going to breathe life and light into you. And then I'm going to leave it up to you. He didn't try to barter with Nicodemus. He said, this is why I came. This is who I am. Come to me. Find rescue. Find find refuge in me. Come and follow me. And I understand you have a life. I understand you have a position. I understand you've got a lot going on. But the offer's here. Come and follow me. And I think for some of us, we really need to pray and ask, what wouldn't Jesus do? We have a lot of hate in our hearts. 
We have a lot of judgment in our hearts. A lot of people know what we're against. Do they know what we're for? The things we post on social media, are we condemning and hating and knocking and, and cutting and slashing? Or are we just saying, man, let's, let's put some happy thoughts out there. Let's put some Jesus thoughts out there. Let's put some truth out there. Let's put uplifting and encouraging things. But this is a spiritual reality because I believe that the darkness, the devil, this principality, the world that we live in is so driven by drama. We love drama. I hate drama. I don't know about you, but I hate it. What I hope is that number one, if you came in today and you were spiritually dead, I pray that your life would be alive, that your spirit, that your soul, that every fiber in you would come to life by calling upon the name of Jesus. And then once that life is breathed in us, then we start to follow him and experience him and we start to see the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is wherever the presence of God is, the presence of his spirit that is indwelling in us. Like think about that. In Luke, I think it's 17, 21 or 22, Jesus is talking to Pharisees again and they say, when is the kingdom of God coming? And Jesus said, it's here and it's in you. The Holy Spirit of God to born again believers is in us. The very kingdom, the very presence of God. And what that does is it starts to shape our life. It starts to shape our mind. It starts to transform the way that we think, the things that we pursue, the way that we see the world. And it's not hate, it's love. It's not hate ever or condemnation or shame or judgment. It's always love. It's always light pursuing the darkness. Jesus said, I'm the light. Here I am. But then after we become Christians, he said, the church is the light. That you're the light. And he said, who would light a light and hide it under a bucket? Like, wouldn't you have that light bright so that all can see? Wouldn't we take that light into the darkness and pursue? There's a real mission that we're supposed to be on, and the mission is to be the light in the darkness, is to radically love this community, is to simply equip people how to make disciples, how to love, how to worship, how to sing, how to give, how to pursue, how to come together in unity, supernatural unity, and say, let's go pursue the darkness the darkness is obvious. We feel it. We live in it. For some of you, your thoughts and your minds, your marriage, your reality, your home, you feel the darkness. But where the kingdom of God is, there's light and it can dispel the darkness. If we were to flip on the lights right now, all of the darkness in this room would be gone because where light is, darkness can't be. This is the mission. So I'm asking our worship team if they'll come back up because we're going to worship here in a second. But it's real simple. Spiritually dead people will not see the kingdom of God. If your spirit is dead, if it's all knowledge up here, you're never going to see the kingdom of God. And if you never see it, you're not going to believe it, and then you're not going to follow. But there's a faith element. It's not logic. It's not you on this knowledge search to prove this thing out. It's, it's simply calling upon Jesus. Letting your spiritual being be, come alive, to be born again. And then like Jesus, he said, I didn't come into the world to condemn the world. I came that it might be saved. And so we are on a rescue mission. The people of God, the born again believers of God, filled with the power of God's light, God's spirit, God's presence, is to go pursue the world. Will you join me? That's why we exist. Will you join me? And so let's pray. Father, I'm overwhelmed. I came in today trusting in your word. trusting in the gospel.
trusting in the power of your Holy Spirit. God, that nobody would leave this room spiritually dead. God so loved the world that you gave your one and only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God, humble us today. Overwhelm us with your presence. Overwhelm us with the truth of who you are and what you're trying to do in this world. Holy Spirit, change our minds, change our thoughts, change our hearts. We want to see the kingdom of God. We want to see your presence. We want to feel that wind blowing like it's never blown before in this community. Holy Spirit, we need you. We're desperate for you. This message is just words on a page if your spirit isn't moving. God, I can't carry the burden of crafty speeches. I trust in your word. I trust in the gospel. And I trust in your Holy Spirit. We want to be children of God. We want to see the kingdom of God. We want to be healed. So Jesus, we look to you. If you haven't looked to Jesus, look to Jesus and you'll be healed. Your sins will be wiped clean. God, we need your presence if we're going to love the lost, if we're going to love the world, if we're going to love the darkness. God, we repent. I repent humbly before you for all the times that I judge all the cutting words that come out of my mouth. The comparison game. The cultural trappings. The self-righteousness. God, we repent. We turn from our knowledge we turn from our logic. We turn from our doubt and our fear. Give us light. Let Creekside Church's light be so bright that the darkness flees. That the spiritually dead would be awakened and come to life. God, that this is just the beginning of what you're doing. Help us to partner together to believe that you're moving. Let us experience you in a very real way. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. I knew today was going to be heavy. Sorry it wasn't funny and entertaining. I actually love to have fun. But I'm overwhelmed. How many people live in our community that don't know Jesus? God put it on my heart to plant this church that we would go reach people far from God. And that is a supernatural thing. So I would ask that in this time of response, please use our prayer team. If God's moving, if God's challenging, if there's fear and doubt of what this even looks like, or if you today want to follow Jesus, please come pray with our team. If you've never been baptized, man, we'd love to baptize you. We had this amazing night, Sunday night. God is moving in this community, but I believe it's just the beginning. We've got communion available. The bread represents Jesus' body that was broken for you on the cross, his death for your sin. The juice represents his blood that was poured out for the forgiveness of sin. So dip the bread and the juice and just have a moment of prayer and just remember and and take in what, what Jesus has done for you. Remember what he did for you on the cross. 
but let's not rush this moment. Let's just sit in it for a minute and let's pray together. Maybe grab a neighbor, grab your wife, grab your friend, whoever it is. Pray in the crowd. Come pray with our team. Come pray by yourself, whatever you need. But just rest in this moment and know that God is doing something amazing. And I invite you to join us for what we're doing. Partner with us. Numbers matter because together we can do more. Generosity matters because together we can do more. Praying for one another and joining our teams and serving together we can do more. We can be the light in North Paulding. And then it's going to spread. It just naturally spreads. The movement of God just keeps spreading. It's like just this ripple effect of some scrubs like us just getting on our face and believing that God is moving. Yeah, I called you a scrub. Aren't we? But man, when we're filled with the power of God, we're children of God. We're ambassadors of God. There's power and authority and gifts and all the promises of scripture are true for us. We become something new when we're born again. And so let's embrace that together. Let's worship together. Let's pray together in this moment. And then let's just go wherever God tells us to go.